And uh, what I thought we'd do is before we pray, let's try to get our hearts um, thinking. And I thought we could do that by uh, playing our this uh, song that uh, I've been um, that we played last time. And I thought this might be a help to get us thinking about this book. And um, so I'm going to play the song and then we'll pray and then we're going to we're going to need some interaction. All right. So we'll see uh, how many have done some reading and uh, we'll see what we can do here. So let's start off. I can get this to work and uh, see if we can first listen uh, to this song uh, together. So that's uh, John Bunyan's Pilgrim Song. I believe that's the only known hymn that we have from John Bunyan, but it really does fit the theme of his book, uh, Pilgrim's Progress. And the idea is that to be a pilgrim uh, requires courage. We need courage in our pilgrim journey. Okay, why don't we uh, pray, and uh, we'll pray for Brother Uchai, and, um, and then we'll get started together. Lord, we do pray you'd give us courage for our pilgrim journey as we also head toward the celestial city. Would you grant us that grace and peace that each one of us so needs? And we know that it is found in Christ. And we pray that you would uh, bless our time together. May it be a help uh, to us, a strengthening uh, for this, uh, for our for our pilgrim journey. We do pray for uh, Brother Uchai, maybe some others as well. Uh, pray that you would restore them to health, give them a physical um, strength at this time. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so the first thing I want to ask you, and um, let's see if I can get some uh, thumbs up here, um, would be how many of you at least read a little bit of Pilgrim's Progress this week? Can you give me a 
thumbs up reaction on your screen or whatever. Okay, I see a real thumb up there. That's good, that'll work. Okay, all right, good. I see one virtual thumbs up, two, three, four, five. Okay, all right, good. Okay, so uh, that's great. All right, well, you know what that means, right? What that means is that the people who gave me a thumbs up, they are the ones I get to call on um, and ask questions. How do you like that? Uh, we'll see what happens. Okay, so let's um, let's uh, start by um, identifying the um, the eight people mentioned by name. Now, I hope I counted this correctly. Maybe if somebody wants to correct me, you can't. But I counted eight people. Uh, in our in our section that were mentioned by name. Okay, uh, let's see. I'll put these on the a whiteboard here. Can, now we're gonna we're gonna go by order in which the names are given. Okay. Um, anybody want to hazard a guess? Okay, I'll try to watch the chat here. Uh, anybody want to hazard a guess? Who was the first person? Uh, mentioned by name. Okay, the first named, uh, the first name that's given. Anybody know the answer? This may be a little tricky, actually. Okay. Um, okay, Christian is a good guess. That's the first person we see. Okay, so that's you know that's your. I mean, we we could put him first, but the first person mentioned by name is technically very good. Is evangelist. OK, so we are, you know, just to be honest, we are introduced to the man that we know as Christian. Um, he, we're introduced to him first uh, in the sense we see him first. But it's kind of interesting, right? His, his name, he's not referred to by name till a little bit later. Right. In fact, so we've got evangelist. Right. And then um, there are two neighbors who join uh, well, I guess not, but two neighbors who are mentioned, right? And um, what's the what's the first of the neighbors uh, that are mentioned? Okay, somebody mentions, um, okay, good. So I'm going to put a pliable, I think obstinate is mentioned, and mentioned if I remember correctly before, uh, pliable. So you've got evangelist, obstinate, pliable. Okay, then and Sister Popo mentioned earlier, kind of interesting, we, we meet a Christian earlier, but we actually don't get his name till his conversation with his neighbors, obstinate and, and pliable. Okay, anybody, um, who's, uh, who's number five? Okay, so there's another person that's mentioned by name. Anybody remember the next person? I'll put him over here uh, as number five here. Anybody remember the next person that's mentioned by name in our story? Okay, good. Okay, somebody mentions uh, help. Okay, so interesting name for a person, right? Uh, Mr. Help. Okay, so you've got help. Okay, and then um, uh, good. Um, we've got uh, somebody mentions here, a worldly wise man. Okay, very good. Okay, worldly wise man. There's two others. Fix my six here. Okay, number seven. Who's who's number seven? Remember the next, the last two people mentioned by name in our story. Anybody remember the first first one? Um, okay, okay, good. Thank you, Sister Joyce, Sister Popo. So legality, Mr. Legality. And number eight is Mr. Legality's son, and his name is what? But remember, I'll, I'll get you started here. Okay, <laughs> very good. Yeah, yeah. Civility. What a name, right? It's like okay, I'm not even sure what the word civility means. Okay, all right. So these are the eight. Did I get them all? Anybody? I think I. Uh, there are some places mentioned, but I think this is the eight uh, named persons in our reading for 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 today. So obviously, and I appreciate what some of you said last uh, last time that we um, 
somebody mentioned, we, we meet these people in our journey, right? So it's, it's kind of neat. I mean, these names uh, of people, but we do meet these in our daily journey uh, as a Christian. And in addition, me, as we meet these people in the book and we see the discussions that take place, it also helps us somewhat in our learning how to respond to people, right? Or even how to gauge people that we meet in our, in our Christian journey. So from each of these people, we, we can learn a lesson. Um, so we've got evangelists. Let me say a word about evangelist. Evangelist is probably some have suggested this may be uh, John Bunyan's way of picturing his pastor, Pastor Gifford or Holy Gifford, as he was sometimes known, John Gifford, who was the human instrument uh, used by God to bring John Bunyan to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ. And so that may be who is being pictured by uh, this person, evangelist. And um, evangelist will appear again in Pilgrim's Progress. We're going to meet him later on in our, in our reading. And um, he, again, plays an important um, role in pointing this man, whom we will uh, be, uh, meet as Christian. He plays an important role in pointing Christian to Christ, and then even helping him on his uh, Christian journey. Okay, and in addition, of course, we've got these two people, um, obstinate and pliable. Okay, these are, obviously, these are neighbors uh, who also live in the city of destruction. And we're going to learn something about these two, especially pliable. And uh, we'll come back uh, to that uh, when I when I ask you some questions about the reading here in just a little bit, but we're going to learn something even by the names of these uh, two uh, two individuals. Um, Christian, of course, this will be the main character in the in the book. Um, he, I'm going to get out of the screen here. Uh, he he's the main character in the book. He is actually his original name is Graceless. And uh, that will come up a little bit later. And of course, that pictures somebody that's outside of Christ, doesn't have that grace of Christ. So he has this original name of, of grace, then, of, of graceless. Then you have help. Then you have Mr. Worldly Wise Man. You have legality and civility, whom we don't really meet in the book, but who are referred to in the book. And... And, um, and Christian is advised to go seek these two individuals. Okay, so let me, um, let me just um, begin by, or let me continue, I guess, by let me read a little bit from Pilgrim's Progress. And then I've got some questions I want to ask you. And uh, if you read in, love to get some feedback if you, if you read uh, in the book. So let me just begin by reading um, the few first few lines from this introduction. This is where uh, Bunyan gets his story uh, started. So introduction has to be on, I think this is page 11 of the, the, the one I gave you, uh, the copy. As I walked through the wilderness of this world, or this is John Bunyan, uh, his voice, he's, he's describing himself here as he's, getting a story, as he's getting his story started. I came upon a certain place where was a den, the Gaol. Okay, now uh, this is uh, an old word for a jail. So this is a way of Bunyan's putting into his book, Pilgrim's Progress, the reminder that he's writing this book from prison. Remember, we talked about this last week. Bunyan actually wrote this from a jail cell. And humanly speaking, we could probably be thankful for that jail cell because that in that jail, 12 years in prison, where you really can't, um, can't go through your normal daily activity, you're limited in your external ministry, and the Lord used this as a time where Bunyan could think. And away from, again, away from activity 
and the Lord used this to help Bunyan do some writing. And one of these books that he produced was Pilgrim's Progress. And this has impacted millions of people. So anyway, this is a reminder that um, he's writing this from jail. I laid me down in that place to sleep. Of course, he's just kind of speaking figuratively. And as I slept, I dreamed a dream. I dreamed and behold, and then here goes the story, right? I saw a man clothed with rags, standing in a certain place with his face from his own house. Okay, so turned away from his own house, a book in his hand and a great burden upon his back. I looked and saw him open the book and read therein. And as he read, he wept and trembled. This is how he launches uh, his story. A man clothed with rags. His face is turned away from his own house. He has a book in his hand. And he has a great burden upon his back. And we're going to see this burden as a, as, a, as, a, as a theme that comes back again in uh, some of these, the opening parts uh, of, this, uh, of this story. And of course, he's reading this book. And as he reads, he weeps and he trembles. And we see on the next page that he breaks out even at a certain point and says, what shall I do? And he's becoming increasingly burdened and broken. And he eventually begins to talk to his family. He can't keep his trouble to himself, this great burden. And um, he, 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 um, he shares with his wife and his children um, his feeling and his burden and of course, uh, as he begins to share his burden, his own relatives, his own family, they think he's a little bit crazy. And um, so they encourage him. I'm looking at page 12. They encourage him. Okay, it's, it's almost nighttime. Um, why don't you get some sleep? Maybe a little sleep will help you feel better <laughs> in, in the morning. Um, but the night is, is just as bad, and he's sighing, and he's crying. And, and when they ask him in the morning how he's doing, he says, oh, I'm actually worse. And, and he starts talking again. And, and, and so they really don't understand the burden that he feels. And of course, this is picturing a person who is being awakened to their sinfulness and becoming aware that they are not right with God, that they, their sin has separated them from God, and increasingly they are burdened about this, but they not, they're not exactly sure what to do about this burden. And so that's, that's how the story gets launched. And then uh, this man meets up with evangelist and he cries out as he's walking in the fields, he cries out, what must I do to be saved? And of course we recognize in that a, um, a, a, a reference to Acts chapter 16 and verse uh, 30 and 31, where you've got this Philippian jailer who uh, burdened in his situation says to Paul and Silas, sirs, what must I do uh, to be saved? Well, this is where he meets up with evangelist and evangelist says to him, why are you crying? And he says, sir, I perceive by the book in my hand that I am condemned to die and after that to come to judgment. And of course, that's a reference to Hebrews 9, 27, as it is appointed for men once to die, but after this, the judgment. And then he makes this statement. Okay, this is where I wanted to ask you a, qu a question. He says, and I find that I am not willing to do the first, nor able to do the second. Okay, could somebody help us a little bit here? What, so what, what, what does he mean when he, 
when he says here, I'm not, I'm not willing to do the first. What do you think he means by that? He says, I'm not willing to do the first, not, and I'm not able to do the second. Anybody, anybody want to, want to help us here? Uh, what do you, what do you think he means by this? You can uh, answer in chat or if somebody wants to speak, you could do that as well. Okay, good. Okay. Thank you, Sister Femi. So yeah, um, he's not willing to die. Do you know anybody, do you know anybody who wants to die? Okay. Um, that's, that's, that, that's a very uh, abnormal thing, right? So he's not well, I mean, he doesn't want to die. He's concerned about that. What does he mean when he says he is unable to do the second? What do you think he means by that? What is he, what is, what is he suggesting in that? Anybody uh, help us with this? So he's not willing to die and he's not able to do what? Okay, to be judged right. Okay, good. What what uh, we mean by that what? Like he's not able, when he says he's not able for the judgment, what do you think he means by that? Okay, to be judged right. Okay, we could we could go there. Um anybody have another comment kind of related to that? He says, I'm not able to do the okay. Okay, good. I like that. Not ready to be judged. Okay, I think I think we're getting close there, right? He's not ready. I mean, he realizes, essentially, I would say this. He's he's not able to stand in the judgment. That's how I would take it. He's he, he realizes he's not ready to be judged. All right. If if he dies and he does he doesn't want to die, uh, but if he dies um, and he stands at the judgment, he knows he's not ready for that. He is not going to stand in the judgment. And of course, we're, we're getting a look into the conscience, the heart of a person who is coming to realize that they are a sinner. And I think we all recognize how important this is for a lost person to come to this point. And many times this is where we struggle to bring a person, right? Um, this is what we want God to do in a person's life. Is it, you know, it seems like we meet people and they are rushing pell-mell through life without giving really much thought to their standing before God. There's not much of a thought of their sinfulness. And I think we all feel like when, when thoughts, when their conscience does begin to speak to them, we have so many distractions and entertainments and things that we can use to drown out any conviction or speaking of our conscience. And that is a great tragedy. Um, what we need, what people need, what a lost person needs is really for, for them to allow their conscience and allow that conviction to have its full course. And bring them to the point where they say, oh, I'm undone. What am I going to do if I die? I'm not going to stand in the judgment. What's going to happen to me? And so we, we see this, this picture that is um, developing in the book. So evangelist, going back here. So evangelist um, then points him. And evangelist says to him, or gives him, I guess, gives him this parchment. And in this parchment is written, flee from the wrath to come. Okay, flee from the wrath to come. And the man answers or asks a very, uh, a very valid question, right? He says, um, um, where should I flee? Right, where does evangelist tell him to flee? You better remember this. So the man says, well, okay, yeah, flee, the, flee from the wrath to come. Where should I flee? What is evangelist's answer to that? Everybody remember this? Where does he tell him to flee to? Somebody help us out here. Okay, good. All right. Like Sister Popo. So yeah, good. Um, toward the wicked gate. Okay, this is not the wicked gate, right? <laughs> that T is really important, right? Um what is a, this is not, I wasn't going to ask you this, but um, what is a wicket uh, gate, right? We don't use this expression much. Um, 
uh, when I was uh, in my showing this to my or teaching this to my class, Christian literature, I showed them a picture in the Philippines. We have um, gates and um, good. Thank you. Um, we have the, a narrow it's a narrow gate is exactly in the Philippines. We have these gates and you'll have like a large gate that is big enough for your car to go into. But within that gate, you'll have a smaller gate that is like your pedestrian gate. And you can open that smaller gate to let yourself in. Uh, and so it's like a gate within a gate or a small gate within a larger gate is the idea of a wicket gate. So the idea is here's this narrow gate uh, for you to enter. So, so Evangelist says, okay, go to the wicket gate. Now, here's a question. Can, can he see, can this man, can he see the gate? Remember, can, can he see the gate? He, he can't see the gate, right? Okay, what, what can he see? The light. The light. Okay. okay, yeah, yeah, exactly. He, he uh, sees the light. The light. Okay, good. Yeah, he, he, can't really, he can't really see the gate, right? Um, but he, he can see the light um, that he, he thinks he sees a light that's uh, shining there from this gate. And uh, the other says, I'm going to read here. He says, do you see the shining light there? He says, I think I do. Evangelist said, keep that light in your eye. Go directly up to it so that you can see the gate. So I, I would say, I, I would say that the point here is that the path to salvation is not yet entirely clear. Would you agree with me? That's the idea here. That um, here's this man, he's burdened about his sin, but the path is not completely clear. He can't fully see his way to Christ yet. And again, you know, this is a story. This is an allegory. So analogies break down at some point, right? But we just got to follow the allegory and let it let it, you know, uh, let it teach us something. So the way is not entirely, the way of salvation, the way to be saved is not yet entirely clear to him. But what is going to be key to that way of salvation becoming clear is going to be that he follows the light of scripture, right? I mean, that's the idea of this light. And you can see in the in the edition that we're looking at here, we've got a couple of passages uh, that refer to scripture as a light. Your word is a lamp to my feet. Uh, we have the prophetic word confirmed, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. And so the idea is, okay, here's a sinner uh, who's awakened to his need. He's, he's seeking the way of salvation. It's not clear to him. What is, what is going to be key in his salvation is going to be scripture. He's got to keep the light of scripture in his heart, in his mind. That's going to make the way clear. So that's what uh, Bunyan is, um, is teaching us as we come to this point. Okay, anybody got a question or comment at this point? We're going to uh, move here towards uh, pliable and obstinate, especially pliable. Anybody got a comment or a thought or a question, something that might be a help to us? Okay, we'll keep moving then. Okay, again, just feel free to jump in at any point here. So I'm going to go down here to uh, the section here on obstinate and pliable. Okay, so this man uh, takes off. And uh, I, I like this picture. He uh, begins to run, and his relatives are calling after him, but he puts his finger in his ears, and he cries out, life, life, eternal life. And you see, I see a man who'd become so burdened, he doesn't care about anything else. He's got, he's got to somehow get the solution to his uh, sin problem. Well, he's got a couple of neighbors, and they begin to co go after him, chase to try to try to bring him back. And of course, one is named obstinate, and the other is named pliable. Okay, and and um, of course, obstinate. We I think we recognize in that name uh, the idea of stubbornness. 
uh, hardness of heart. And we see that, right, an obstinate. He, he is not going to be persuaded at all to start any kind of a pilgrim journey. His only goal is to bring uh, Christian back. Um, and so he's not going to take the journey at all. But we've got this man pliable, okay? Let me ask you a question. How would you, um, how would you define pliable? Like what, when, when we say the word pliable, um, what, what would be another English word or phrase or thought that would come to your mind? How, how would you, how would you, how would you, we don't use the word pliable too much. How would you define how, you know, what, what do we, um, okay, good. Um, flexible. All right. That's a good one. And what else? One that's not rooted or grounded. Okay. Not, not rooted. Okay. Good. Not rooted, not grounded. Um, good. Very good. Okay. How about this? Easily persuadable. That's not, that's, that kind of fits our story too, doesn't it? All right. Easily persuadable. Okay. Um, you kind of think of a, of a child almost, right? I mean, a child can be easily persuaded, right? You could, um, that, that's probably a good one right there. If we go with that easily persuadable, right? He, um, and you, we, that's the picture we get of this man pliable. Okay, when he goes after Christian, he's not thinking about his own joining this. He's been persuaded by obstinate, right? But then he meets Christian and he gets pretty easily persuaded to change his mind and he's going to follow Christian. And we're going to see him easily persuaded to not follow Christian, right? So here we go. Here's this man, uh, pliable. And of course, this is picturing, right? This is picturing real life type people that we meet that maybe we know so pliable decides that he's uh, again i like this easily persuaded okay so he uh decides that he's gonna follow uh follow christian um what is this is kind of struck me as i was looking through this what is pliable's focus like what you know as pliable decides to follow christian on his pilgrim journey because of what Okay, what, 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 what is it that, that entices him to this journey? Anybody pick up on this? And it comes out of their conversation, some of his questions. What, what, what has caught his eye? Okay, good. Thank you, Sister Joyce. Um, the pleasures, okay, good. The pleasures promised, right? He, he's, you know, he's seeing the glitter of the gold, right? And, and you see this, right? If you just kind of scan through this here, if you've got your copy in front of you, see if I can uh, find this uh, where uh, pliable. Um, so pliable says there are such things to be had. Uh, uh, let's see, I'm gonna keep going down here. Um, Come then good neighbor, let us be going. So then they both went together so on and so on. Okay, so um, uh, Christian, come neighbor, this is page 19. Come neighbor, pliable, how do you do? I'm glad you're persuaded and so on. Uh, so pliable here. Um, so tell me more now what the things are and how they are to be enjoyed at the place where we are going. Uh, so again, notice his focus. And, and then pliable says, well said, what things are they? Okay, his focus is on these things in this book. Uh, Christian, there's an endless kingdom. Uh, well said. And what else? Bottom of page 19. What else is there? And then Christian goes on about some of the other things. There's a crown and the righteous shine and so on. And Pliable says, that's very pleasant. And what else? <laughs> Christian says, there'll be no more crying, no more sorrow and so on. And Pliable says, and what company shall we have there? And, and Christian describes some of the different angelic creatures that are there and thousands and ten thousands and so on. And, and Pliable says, bottom of page 21, uh, the hearing of this is enough to ravish one's heart. Um, but are these things to be enjoyed? How shall we get to be sharers of them? Uh, and so then Christian kind of tries to explain a little bit of how that can happen. And, and then uh, page 22, well, my good companion, says Pliable, I'm glad to hear of these things. Come on, let us change our pace. Right, so 
when Pliable says, let us change our pace, Christian replies, I cannot go as fast as I desire by reason of this burden that is on my back. So let me, let me ask us a question here. Let's just pause for a, a little bit here. What, so, okay, he's so good. So the idea, okay, he's pliable's interested in the pleasures. He's interested in what's going to profit him, right? Oh, okay, this sounds really good. But we get to this part here where he wants to travel faster and Christian can't. Why can't pliable, I'm sorry, let me, let me change that. Why can't Christian travel as fast as pliable? What is, here, here's a question. What is pliable missing? What does pliable not have that Christian has? And I think this is really key. Okay, very good. Okay, yes, exactly. What Pliable doesn't have is he doesn't have, okay, we'll just take some of these answers. He doesn't have a burden of sin. He doesn't have any conviction over sin. He doesn't have an earnest seeking heart. He's interested in the pleasure. He's interested in the end goal but there's no conviction of sin. He's not burdened about his sin. And we really do see the difference, don't we? This is what Bunyan, I think, is deliberately, intentionally picturing. The difference between a person who's real, okay, I've got to solve my sin problem, and somebody who just, I mean, they'd love to see angels. They love to have this kingdom. They love the way this looks but there really is no thought about their own personal sin problem. And, and we're going to see this come out, right? Because when they get to, um, when they get to this slew of despond, we're going to see a real difference, right? So they come to the slew of despond. Now, I think some could say slough. Uh, my understanding is that the American pronunciation is slew, and the British pronunciation is slough, okay? So um, if you're British, you can say slough, okay? <laughs> so anyway, uh, whatever the interpretation, whatever the meaning of this is, or I mean, sorry, whatever the way to say it is, pronunciation, okay? So um, he, uh, so they come to this uh, slew of despond, and of course, this is where um, they get stuck in the mire. But what is this slew of despond? Okay, so despond means what? Means like what? Discouragement, despair, um, something along that line. What uh, the slew of despond is discouragement from what? Anybody, anybody know the answer to this? Okay, somebody says the trials of life. Okay, we could we could start there. I think we could go a little bit. It's it's there's a there's a I think there's a deeper point ab about this. The slew of despond is a discouragement, despair, specifically. Okay, you got difficulties. Okay, trials. Let me take this down a little bit. Um because you actually have to kind of go a little further down in this, actually. So I'm looking down at page 24. And this is after he meets help. Okay, good. Now, some of you, okay, good. So yeah, his own sins, the sins of others. Okay, we want to get the word sin in here. Um, and I'm looking on page 24. And uh, because Christian says, sir, wh um, why? Since this place is the way from the city of destruction, why doesn't somebody fix this? I mean, why, why is this thing here? And he says to me, this miry slough is such a place as cannot be repaired. It is the descent where the scum and filth that attends conviction for sin continually runs 
and therefore it is called the slew of despond. For still as the sinner is awakened about his lost condition, there arises in his soul many fears and doubts and discouraging apprehensions, all of which get together and settle in this place, and this is the reason this ground is so bad. So this, this, this place of despair or discouragement is what it is, is it's the discouragement or the despair that can come as a result of conviction of sin, where you almost despair of ever being delivered from your sin. Uh, this reminds me of a guy I um, was able to point to Christ and he ended up getting baptized a few months ago, I guess, I, mean, I forget, September, October. Um, but he came to church that morning and he said to the girl who brought him, he said, after he heard something in Sunday school, he said, he said, I don't think God would ever save me. I don't think, I think I'm beyond saving. Um, that's the kind of despair that a lost person can feel sometimes is I, I don't think God could ever save me. That's what's being pictured, I think, in this slew of despond. What I like is if, if you're following where I, where I was reading, there's the very next sentence on page 24. It is not the pleasure of the king that this place should remain so bad. Okay, so we may, you know, that, that's a natural response of a sinner who's been awakened to his sin. I don't think God would ever save a person like me. But here's a great line, right? It's not the pleasure of the king that the place should remain that bad. Um, God, God doesn't want us to stay in the slough of despair. Yes, we've got to realize all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Yes, we've got to come to the point where we realize the wages of sin is death. But that that's not where God wants us to stay. In fact, across the slew of despond, help points out, across the slew of despond, there are actually steps which unfortunately are sometimes invisible. Anybody, anybody think about this? This is not maybe super intuitive. What do you think those steps are? What is Bunyan picturing by the steps? You got this place of despair over sin. What are these steps? Anybody, anybody, anybody give any thought to this? Help has to point out these steps. I mean, you really can't even hardly see these because of this of the despair in the soul. And uh, but help says actually there are steps here. You should have stepped on the steps uh, instead of just uh, going through this miry uh, slew. Anybody got a maybe want to hazard a guess? Again, this is maybe not quite as uh, as. Obvious. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So provision as stepping stones. What are, what is that provision? Okay. What are those stepping stones? That's plural. Go ahead. It could, it could be the way that um, we come to Christ, um, knowing that we're sinners and, um, you know, okay. the steps that we take to accept him into our okay. life. Okay. That's good. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, some have suggested, I, I kind of like this idea, that these are promises. What these steps are picturing are the promises that the sinner is to lay hold of on his way to Christ. That, I mean, there, I mean, really, if you think about yourself, it is pretty discouraging, right? <laughs> I mean, you think about your despair, um, and we got to think of this more as a sinner coming to Christ. What is the hope? And, and, and you know, obviously Christ is the hope and so on. But the idea, I think, is that you have these promises that God has given even to sinners, that there are promises that we lay hold of in Christ that are ultimately bring us, they're going to bring us help or bring us uh, hope. Okay, so moving on here, we got to wrap up here, so I don't want to take... Um, too much longer here so he so he ends up of course pliable um, and pliable doesn't sink in the mire as much remember because pliable doesn't have the burden for his sin 
So Pliable gets out of this slew pretty easily. Um, Christian struggles because he does feel the burden of his sin, but he, he, he still is struggling to get out the direction away from his house. You don't want to miss that. Pliable gets out on the side closest to home. Christian, oh, he's struggling. It's, it's terrible, but he's, gonna, he's still on his way. He's still, he's still on his way to try to find uh, help <laughs> and deliverance. Um, so he gets out. And um, he's buried, he's got this heavy burden of sin, right? And he meets Mr. Worldly Wise Man. And what, what Christian brings up to Worldly Wise Man is his burden. And um, what, is, what is the way that Worldly Wise Man, I mean, Worldly Wise Man understands the burden. He doesn't, he doesn't make light in a sense of Christian's burden. Okay, this burden of sin. What does worldly wise men say is the way for Christian to be delivered from his burden? Anybody pick up on this? This is, this is helpful. Okay, what is the way for Christian to be relieved of that burden? Anybody pick up on this? He's got some advice for him. How can he be delivered from his burden of sin? Okay. All right. Good. Okay. We've got it. Okay. Good. Everybody is bringing in the word law. Okay. Where'd you get that word law from? <laughs> okay. How about, how about the name like this, Mr. Legality, right? So Mr. Worldly, Mr. Worldly Wiseman says, you need to go visit Mr. Legality. Mr. Legality lives very near a high hill. Do you remember what the name of that high hill is? What's the name of that high hill? This is great. Okay, good. Thank you, Sister Popo. Yeah, Mount Sinai. Okay, well, when you hear Mount Sinai, I, I think all of us, if you're a Bible reader, right? You, okay, that's where the Ten Commandments came in. That's the law. Right. That's why we had the word law come in into the chat. Right. Exactly. I mean, Mr. Worldly Wiseman is saying, you've got that burden. I'm, I'm just going to paraphrase. You've got that. I'm so sorry you got that burden. Um, oh, yeah, you were reading that book. You really shouldn't read that book. That's going to that's going to bother you. Oh, you ran into evangelist. Ah, you don't want to do that. OK, he's not going to be able to help you. I've got advice for you. You need to go see Mr. Legality. He's gonna, he lives by Mount Sinai. He's going to help you get rid of that burden. In fact, there's, a, there's nice places to live there. They're cheap, affordable. You're going to be surrounded by good people, moral people who live there. And you're going to find there, you're going to find relief from your burden. All right. All right. So what is, you know, what is Bunyan doing by us meeting Mr. Worldly Wiseman, by Christian meeting uh, Obviously, the idea is what? How many people try to find relief from their burden of sin by keeping the law? That somehow, okay, I've got this burden of sin and it's so great. And here's what I need to do. I just need to obey more. I just need to keep the law more. If I could somehow keep the law, if I could be obedient, if I could do good works, then I'll be relieved of my burden. And of course, what we actually find, right? What we actually find is, does, um, does that actually help Christian? I mean, what happens to, as he travels toward Mount Sinai, does the burden on his back, does it get heavier or lighter? Right, what, what happens, right? I mean, his burden gets what? His burden gets heavier. Okay, it gets heavier. Okay, good. Um, it, get, it gets heavier. And, and really, that, that honestly is, is what it's like, right? It gets heavier. Um, and I, I think of Martin Luther, right, and his journey toward salvation. When he became aware of how sinful it was, he tried. So I mean, he, he tried to somehow, by, by greater obedience, greater bodily asceticism, um, he says he probably would have killed himself. 
in his effort to somehow do things to his body that would keep him from sinning and would free his conscience, and he couldn't do it. And of course, what Bunyan is picturing to us is that no man will ever be justified by keeping the law. In fact, by the law is the what? By the law is the knowledge of sin. And when somebody really honestly tries to keep the law to somehow find peace from their burden of sin, what actually happens is what? That burden gets heavier. It gets to be unbearable. And, and so what Bunyan is, is doing is just, he's showing us, okay, one of the sidetracks that people often take is, is to try to go toward the law, try to go toward keeping the Ten Commandments, try to go toward good works. And his point is, that's not going to do it. That no man, again, will ever be justified by keeping the law. In fact, right, he ultimately, evangelist, comes to Christian points him back in the way he should go, right? And um, an evangelist says this, and I, I like this. Maybe you can help me here uh, one last time here as we wrap up. Evangelist says, actually, Mr. Worldly Wiseman's advice is saving you from the what? Okay, there was a word that, a word that caught my eye here. Uh, there was three things. Mr. Evangelist says, okay, three things about his advice that are bad. He says, his advice is actually saving you from the, anybody can complete my one word, complete that sentence. He's, his advice is saving you from the, am I getting this right? Okay, good. All right, good. Uh, the cross. Okay, trying to follow the law for salvation is a way to avoid the cross. You are not going to find any peace from your burden of sin apart from the cross. And any advice, any religious system that helps you avoid the cross is going to lead you on the way of eternal damnation. Our greatest glory is the cross. And of course, Paul says that in Galatians 6, essentially, I boast, my boast is the cross. And so that is, um, that's kind of where our story ends for today. So Christian is back on the way. He's going to come to the cross. It's going to be a little while, um, but he's back on the way toward the cross and the way of the cross leads home. Anybody have any thoughts? I'm going to end there, but any thoughts or questions or comments you think might be helpful? Thank you for, uh, for the input here. Any thoughts as we wrap up here? So I know many of you are, um, are probably headed toward bed in a little bit, right? as um, evening has come there in Singapore. But you could, um, you could get up tomorrow and say, Lord, lead me to somebody who is thinking the law will ease his or her burden of sin. Lead me to somebody like that and help me to point them to the cross in some way. May God use us that way. Okay, any final thoughts, questions? So there really is a lot of theology, right? Somebody has texted me or chatted me here. Theology and allegory, absolutely. Okay, he, he's teaching, mean, and that's his point, right, in the introduction is, is let my allegory teach you some theology. Oh, that really is what he's doing here. All right, why don't we uh, close in prayer then? Father, thank you for the way this book does teach truth via allegory. Lord, use us. Lord, there are people all around us. And some of those are burdened about sin and think that somehow by doing good, pursuing morality or civility, that they will somehow ease that burden. Lord, help us. Lead us to people whom we can point to the cross. Lord, please. 
We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. Well, thank you for joining us, Brother Uchai. I'm so sorry you're not feeling well. I hope the Lord gives you strength to recover. So I've had COVID twice. Um, there is hope on the other side. <laughs> So may the Lord strengthen you, brother. So Lord willing, we'll see you next time. Okay. And you've got the reading schedule. And Lord willing, we'll, we'll see you. you next time. All right. Goodbye, everybody.